Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to Harvard Chan School of Public Health. I'm Vaughan Rees. I direct the Center for Global Tobacco Control um, in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, where I'm also senior lecturer. I'll be moderating today's discussion, and I'm delighted to be joined by, um, to my immediate left, uh, Mavis Nemo, the CEO of Tapestry, a community-based nonprofit uh, organization providing sexual and reproductive health care harm reduction and WIC services access in Western Massachusetts. Um, next uh, on the panel is Kesa Rivera. Uh, Kesa is a harm reduction specialist at Victory Programs, a Boston-based nonprofit that provides housing, health prevention and recovery services. And on the end of the panel, uh, Dr. Brandon Marshall, uh, Professor of Epidemiology at Brown University School of Public Health. Um, and Brandon is the founding director of People, Place and Health Collective at Brown University. Thank you for coming and welcome. And joining us remotely is Sheila Vakaria, Deputy Director of the Department of Research and Academic Engagement at Drug Policy Alliance and author of The Harm Reduction Gap, Helping Individuals Left Behind by Conventional Drug Prevention and Abstinence-Only uh, Treatment. Uh, welcome, Sheila. Tragically, more than a million people in the US have died from overdoses in the last 25 years. Sheila, can you kick us off by providing a quick snapshot of the overdose crisis? Absolutely, and first of all, I want to thank you all so much for inviting me and allowing me to participate, even though I could not be with you in person today. So sadly, we are now in over two decades uh, into this drug overdose crisis here in the United States. We have lost over 1.2 million people to preventable drug overdose. Uh, based on statistics that were provided to us by the CDC, as of 2022, we are clear that we lost about 108,000 people to overdose death. And this is after losing about 107,000 people to drug overdose in 2021. Although it may seem that drug deaths are plateauing, we cannot accept that this is the new normal. Um, and we have to acknowledge that over the course of the 20 years of this overdose crisis, it has gone through what many of us call several waves. We are currently in what many call the fourth wave of this crisis. Uh, in the first wave of the crisis, most people who are familiar or who have been watching the news or the coverage uh, heard about the involvement of prescription opioids involved in overdose deaths, driving most of the deaths at the time. Um, but after crackdowns on prescribing habits, prescribers, and dispensing, we saw a shift in overdose deaths to the underground drug market, uh, heroin. And it, after heroin involved overdose deaths started to increase, we call that the second wave of the crisis. And um, sadly, when fentanyl entered our drug supply after heroin busts and heroin enforcement, uh, suppliers were incentivized to smuggle in far more discreet, potent drugs, um, including fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. And that's when around 2013, 2014, we saw overdose deaths on a national scale dramatically increase again. Many of us talk now, since 2017 or so, that we are currently in the fourth wave of this crisis. Not only is fentanyl driving overdose deaths, but the co-involvement of stimulant drugs such as cocaine or methamphetamine are now also driving deaths. What's also um, notable about the shifting waves of this crisis is the face of who was dying and where they lived. And so the first wave of the crisis, which many people are familiar with, where we saw prescription opioid deaths uh, driving the crisis, um, it was largely a white face. It was a rural face. It was a working or middle class face and it was centered in Appalachia. But as the crisis has shifted, we've been able to really talk about the racial disparities that have emerged in the crisis, particularly around the third and fourth waves when fentanyl emerged as a drug driving deaths. And so we can say now um, that really this is not just a white crisis. It's not uh, one driven solely by prescription opiates, if at all, anymore. Um, we're talking about a polysubstance crisis, a crisis affecting not only our rural communities, but our urban centers, um, and sadly, one that's disproportionately impacting communities of color. Sheila, thank you for that, that uh, very critical overview of, of the nature of the problem. I want to turn now to um, ways that we can save lives through harm reduction interventions. Harm reduction, of course, is a way of, uh, of uh, promoting uh, strategies that can help to reduce the, the negative effects of drug use and critically to engage substance users um, in ways that can promote um, opportunities uh, for interventions. 
Um, I want to take a look at a series of interviews provided by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. At the intersection where compassion meets community, harm reduction takes on a more active role to avoid negative health outcomes. And it does so by meeting the community where they are at. Harm reduction is basically bettering a person's life in the whole community. Harm reduction to me is being able to go to a place and get clean stuff to use and not have to like rely on like going to a street and buying it or like hoping you're getting something clean or whatever it is. Harm reduction is holding someone by the hand and saying, you're gonna come with me because I have the time to commit to you because you're worth it. And so what do you need? Do you need to go to detox? I'm gonna go with you. Did you get them to the door? Did you follow up two days later to make sure they're still in treatment or did they fall out? It should be, hey, I'm in this journey with you. You've now met me. You seem to want to do something to better your life and I'm gonna support you. Let's run that mission. Harm reduction is understanding and compassion and strength and very nuanced. Harm reduction, it's love. We just heard the importance of love and compassion for drug <clears throat> users. I'm really interested in how other ways that we can destigmatize uh, substance use. And um, Case, I wonder if we could start with you on some, <laughs> some thoughts that you might have on that topic. <laughs> Um, well, I've been a year and six months working in harm reduction, and it has opened my eyes more than working in, re in recovery programs. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. harm reduction back then was not hardly heard. Yeah. And being this, um, year and a half with recovery programs, it's amazing. Yeah. They show so much love and compassion for our members and we call them members because they're they're not clients, they're not patients, they're our members. And we're there for them. Yeah. You know, um, whatever they need, any type of help, we're really there for them. And it's always when they're ready. We don't rush them. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. And Mavis, I'm curious about your thoughts as well. And you know, harm reduction um, for tapestry, we, we started many, many years ago and we're still the only syringe um, or needle exchange provider um, in Western Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, really understanding all of the issues um, and the stigma that people who use drugs face, um, including some of the public health issues associated with, you know, not having clean or safer supplies to utilize. Um, was really how we started. Um, we built relationships and uh, you know what the founders of our program really wanted to drive home was the idea that we need to destigmatize um, drug use and that's the way that we save lives. And once we start to destigmatize and we open up communication and we see people as individuals um, and we extend humanity and grace to individuals um, that then we can actually make some inroads on stopping overdoses, on stopping infectious disease. Um, and so for us, it's a partnership with our community. Um, it is completely mission driven and we have a lot of individuals in our program, as I'm sure in yours, who have direct lived experience. Um, and they use that knowledge to meet people exactly where they're at. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. And thank you. When also when we do outreach, we don't just hand out a bag of supplies and just say keep it going. Mm -hmm. We're there, we talk to them, we let them know we're here for them. Mm -hmm. We let them know where we work at, Victory Connectors, come, we're there. And, and engaging with your members is, is a critical exactly. part of your mission and, yeah. and, and plays a big role mm -hmm. in destigmatizing. And you'd be surprised with how much you, you gain by doing that. Wonderful, thanks. Yeah. yeah. So Rhode Island recently approved the state's first overdose prevention center, which is slated to open later this year in Providence. Um, Brandon, can you, can you explain what the site um, will be doing? Sure, Vaughn. Yeah, so overdose prevention centers are harm reduction interventions. Uh, they are spaces where people can consume pre-obtained substances under supervision. You might ask why that supervision is important, right? 
Well, it's because, especially with today, with our drug supply being so potent and unpredictable, um, supervision allows intervention in the event of an overdose very quickly and rapidly to administer naloxone, uh, naloxone or oxygen to intervene and save that person's life. Um, these are not new interventions. They've been around since the 1980s. There are more than 200 operating around the world. Um, only two publicly recognized overdose prevention centers currently exist in New York City, but as you mentioned, will be the first uh, state authorized uh, center to open in Providence later this summer. I think the last thing I'll highlight too is that in addition to the immediate public health benefit of offering that supervision service, overdose prevention centers provide a lot of other services mm -hmm. as well yeah. to connect people to care and treatment, housing, recovery supports, you know, much what Case is talking about, those kinds of yeah. services are integrated into overdose prevention centers and are available immediately to connect people with care. And so in addition to saving lives, they also provide important pathways into healthcare and treatment services. I think that that's a critical piece of harm reduction interventions that we, we really need to appreciate. Um, okay, so you talked a little bit about the importance of meeting people where they're at. Um, could you, uh, you, and you work with um, people who use drugs on a daily basis, can you um, tell me a little bit more about how people respond to you when you're meeting them for the first time? Mm -hmm. um, are they resistant or fearful? How do you help we have them both. to, to in, how do you help engage? We have them? some members that would just engage Mm. And, you know, we have other members that just want time. Mm -hmm. We let them come in, we do their um, intake and assessment, and we let them engage in our center, have some coffee, watch TV, mm. relax, you know, take a nap if you need it. We got food if you need it. And we don't rush them to speak because mm -hmm. Me personally, I know how it is when you jump into asking questions. You know, how nervous they get, they get, they're scared. They don't trust. So we give them that time after the intake and assessment to, for them to be able to feel comfortable. And we start our conversations with them little by little. We don't do it the whole talking or conversation on the same day. They keep coming back, and they keep talking more. It sounds like trust is 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 the really yeah. critical piece. Because they're already traumatized. Yeah. You know, they're already broken, and the work that we do there is, we don't make them feel more broken as they are. Yeah. We show them the compassion. That's wonderful. Um, recent data from the CDC shows Black and Indigenous people are experiencing the highest rates of overdose deaths. Um, how can we better serve these communities? And um, maybe I'd love to turn to you with that one. Um, this is an interesting question for me. Um, also, as a person of color, I think that um, you know our data in our current crisis and epidemic, as it was unfolding around opioid use, um, really centered sort of the white experience. Uh, you heard a lot about sort of advertising that it's your soccer mom or it's, you know, the lunch lady now who is using opiates and now is on this path to addiction and mm -hmm. now we're using sort of illicit drugs, heroin and other things. And the truth is in our communities, particularly communities of color, it had always been, you know, an epidemic. It had always been a crisis. Um, just access to care in general um, is not the same and we know this data supports it for people of color as it is for our white counterparts. Um, and so we really need to first develop a better strategy as opposed to refocusing on a strategy. Um, you know, this is sort of the tail end of what we've always known has been these challenges. Um, there's been a lot of models that have been um, positioned and I think one of the, the things that may not be um, top of mind is really looking at policy. And so in, in communities of color, um, the interventions have been always criminal legal system sort of adjudication. Um, and a lot of people of color would find their first time or their first approaches in treatment in a carceral setting. And that's a completely layered experience. Um, and so one, I would say that we have to overall look at our approaches from a criminal legal system perspective in terms of that first intervention because we know that people of color are not accessing treatment, are not ask, uh, 
accessing hospital-based care in the same ways and in the same rates as our white counterparts. Um, so it might be counterintuitive, but I would start there. Um, and then people need to be intentional about coming into those communities with people from those communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, to start asking and dialoguing, right, about what those issues are. Um, particularly for communities of color, we know that all of the social determinants of health are, you know, precursors to a lot of drug use. And so we're gonna have a conversation about our school systems, our water supplies, um, food deserts, those sort of things. So it's gonna be, a, I think, an all hands-on approach um, in terms of lifting the tide in the ways that which we are going to communicate and work with our communities of color um, around addiction and overdose. Um, more access, more availability of supplies, keep them localized as possible. So in the short term, to answer your question, I think are beginning steps um, to, to how we chip away at that. And I, I'd love uh, Sheila to uh, give her perspective on addressing uh, the needs of, uh, of minority communities. Yeah, and I just want to piggyback and uh, second everything that Ms. Mavis just illustrated and described because I think that all of those components are so clearly needed. And one of the things that I wanted to kind of double down on in my earlier remarks was the perception in the first wave of this crisis of prescription opioid deaths that it was a white face when in fact we have had a native or indigenous overdose crisis since the very beginning of this crisis. And so um, many people ascribe to the so-called deaths of despair um, narrative of ex you know explaining or describing why all of a sudden white overdose deaths were going up, but only within the context of trying to explain why white mortality was going down in the early days when really um, had they included indigenous data and indigenous um, uh, analysis, they would have actually been able to um, identify those trends and it would have kind of helped that theory fall apart. And so I really highlight a, a seminal paper by Dr. Sam, uh, Joe Friedman and Helena Hansen in which they talk about um, indigenous data genocide um, and the need for us to truly recognize and um, look and examine the trends in terms of overdose deaths. And I also want to highlight that in 2017, 2018, it looked like national overdose deaths were stabilizing. And the only reason it looked like they were stabilizing as they look like they are now between 21 and 22 was because white deaths were not increasing dramatically at a high rate. However, both in 2017, 2018, and in 21, 22, we saw continued increases, sadly, in overdose deaths among Native communities, Latinx communities, and Black communities. And so I want to also just kind of highlight that um, you know, focusing too much on national trends can often wash out really key racial and ethnic disparities in who's being affected and how they're being impacted. One other additional note that I would ask to piggyback off of Ms. Mavis's um, earlier comments is not only are there disparities in how people in, um, access and feel safe in accessing healthcare in this country, we have to talk about the disparate treatment of communities of color um, by healthcare providers. There are two life-saving medications, methadone and buprenorphine. These are two medications that are the gold standard treatments, FDA approved uh, to treat opioid use disorder or opioid addiction. And we have decades of data showing that when people are given access to either of these medications, it can reduce the likelihood of a fatal opioid overdose among these patients by over 50%. And sadly, what we see continuously is tremendous disparities in who gets access to these medications, how they are dispensed, and how they are treated while they are continued to be maintained on these medications. And so it's really important not only to you know, point the finger at the broader healthcare system, but to actually also really talk about how the gold standard treatments that we have available are not available to the communities who need them the most. And when we also zoom in on, for instance, indigenous or native overdose deaths and black overdose deaths at this current moment in time, they are more likely to experience polysubstance overdose deaths involve, involving a stimulant on board in addition to the fentanyl or the opioid. And so we have to think about how are we engaging communities of color who are engaging in polysubstance use? And in particular, indigenous communities having highest rate, the highest rates of methamphetamine-involved overdose and black communities having the highest rates of cocaine-involved overdose. And knowing that both of those stimulant drugs are smoked drugs. 
And when thinking about how do we engage people who, you, who, who consume smokable drugs into existing harm reduction infrastructure, which in many ways is very needle or syringe centric, and that is very much targeted to a primary opioid user. And so not only is it about thinking about expanding access to these FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder, but how do we engage people who use stimulant drugs, who likely are smoking those drugs, into services so that they can learn about naloxone as, an, as the reversal medication, learning about fentanyl test strips, learning about all of these other kinds of harm reduction and interventions that are available to them. And lastly, I would say that we have to implicate our research infrastructure, because why is it that at this point in the crisis, we have two life-saving medications for opioid addiction yet we had a crack epidemic in the 80s and we never emerged with an FDA approved stimulant medication to help people who use stimulant drugs. And instead, as Ms. Mavis said, we leaned on incarceration and punishment. And so I think the other really big thing that we need to acknowledge is that we need more efficacious and widespread availability of medications for stimulant use. And the one evidence-based treatment we do have for stimulant use disorder called contingency management is one that's not readily available in most parts of our country. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Sheila. Um, I'm going to shift slightly to some more policy focused questions. And um, in particular, just a few weeks ago, the Biden administration announced the White House challenge to save lives from overdoses, which includes investment in harm reduction services. One problem, of course, is that, uh, that, that investment and support at a state and local level has been somewhat patchy. Um, how do you respond to concerns that uh, overdose prevention centers and other harm reduction services um, one common criticism is that they will um, uh, attract substance users to, uh, to the local area and cause uh, local problems um, in places where they might be set up. Um, I wonder, Brandon, if you could give us some thoughts on that. Sure. You know, fortunately, this is an area where we have a lot of evidence to guide us to show that a lot of these concerns are not founded in science and data. We know actually that overdose prevention centers, har other harm reduction programs, improve the neighborhood conditions in the communities in which they're located. You know, there was a research study that came out just a few months ago from New York City that showed reductions uh, in uh, 911 calls for crime and medical conditions after the two overdose prevention centers were opened in Washington Heights and East Harlem. So, you know, we can point to evidence and say pretty convincingly, I think, that in fact, when you incorporate harm reduction services into a community, you can address a lot of the challenges around uh, public drug use, you know, discarded syringes and so on. So if there's concerns about those kinds of issues in communities, harm reduction actually is one solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah wonderful. Um, okay, so just wondering if you have some thoughts on that question <laughs> at a very local level. Um, I just, I just want to say that harm reduction does save lives and it does change. It helps our members change. Um, you, I've, throughout the years that I have heard about harm reduction and how people see it in the negative way, it's like ignorance, yeah. I want to mm -hmm. say. Uh -huh. And those that are not educated of harm reduction doesn't know what they're saying. Yeah. From a person that's in recovery for almost 26 years now, I wish harm reduction was back then. Yeah. I wish harm reduction was there. You know, throughout my process of getting into recovery was not easy. You know, and, and it's good to have somebody that's going to be there no matter what you're going through. Yeah. That doesn't judge you, doesn't label you. You don't hear no stigma going around. You don't hear nobody in our Victory Connector or the whole victory program calling our members zombies. Mm -hmm. They're not zombies, they're humans. Yeah. And that, you know, that all comes from a mob of uh, ignorance. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Kay. So really appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, you know, onto, a, on, onto another point, we, we see drug overdoses, of course, are happening 
all across the United States, but progress has varied from state to state. We've heard how Rhode Island, for example, is making strides in opening an overdose uh, prevention center. But meanwhile, Philadelphia has recently banned safe injection sites. Why are we seeing such differences across the country? Um, uh, perhaps Mavis, you might want to give us some thoughts. Oh, thank you, Vaughn. And I, I spent some time in Pennsylvania. Um, I worked at the state level um, in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia specifically, and I think with any place, um, politics. Um, and it's, I think it's an interesting phenomenon when I observe it is, you know, our, our communities that were led by quote unquote more progressive candidates um, and elected officials um, have sort of turned the corner. And this is not by and large, uh, but, but it is a trend. So n turn the corner in terms of their approach to social services, incorporating more law enforcement and cracking down, if you will, um, on individuals who use drugs. Uh, because they're they're talking about things like blight um, and you know not attracting sort of a business base and all of these sorts of things, while simultaneously ignoring the public health crisis in, in, at their feet. Um, and so, and I'm not speaking just about Philadelphia. I'm saying in communities by and large, um, the approach and the trends have shifted, particularly for uh, folks that we wouldn't have thought necessarily would happen in, in cities that we didn't necessarily think um, that would happen. Um, I think you have to pick your priorities. Um, I don't know how you attract business. I don't know how you create jobs when your community is overdosing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you do these things when there is no place for people to go. Um, and, you know, we all things get caught up in this sort of swirl of, of politics. Um, and, you know, I think for individuals like myself who have been on both ends of it, you know, ultimately you have to pick your priority as a community. Is, the, is that to save lives? Is it to have people vibrant and present um, to create those opportunities? Well, none of those things can happen if people are overdosing and dying. Um, and you would think that that would make sense, but, um, Another sort of phenomenon is the influence of business and money in our political realm um, and the ways in which people are incentivized to actually ignore the best and better practices in public health for the sake of economic opportunity or empowerment or, or bringing development into a specific community. Um, and unfortunately for people who use drugs and, and their allies and their co-conspirators, you know, they haven't built up the same amount of political capital or power to counter um, the money and the influence um, in this in this sphere. I know for lo locally um, where Tapestry is, and we are sort of throughout Western Massachusetts, um, you know, we have seen a shift in our communities, sort of our more conservative communities in terms of, you know, um, the tax base and things of that nature, have now seen the crisis at their front door. And so they've started to contact us to say, can you help? Uh, can you bring safer supplies? Uh, can you help with individuals who may need other types of services? Um, and so I'm hopeful about that trend in our communities. Um, but, but as I said, most things um, that we know uh, would really impact our communities in a meaningful, powerful way get caught up in the swirl of politics. Um, and, and that's a shame on us. You know, that's a shame on our, our infrastructure and our systems. Thanks so much, Mavis, for those thoughts. We've just got time for a couple more quick questions. And this one is for um, Brandon. Oregon removed criminal penalties for street drugs in 2021, but they are now looking to reverse that policy and recriminalize possession of most drugs, citing increases in overdose deaths. What lessons can we learn from the Oregon experience? Yeah, Vaughn, I would say two things. Uh, the first is that we have several studies now that have shown pretty definitively that the increase in overdose deaths in Oregon is not due to the implementation of Measure 110. Uh, it was due to the introduction of fentanyl into the unregulated drug supply in that state, which unfortunately coincided almost perfectly with the passing of that law. Uh, and so, you know, we know that that law is not leading to increases in overdose deaths. It really is the supply and other things such as ongoing unaffordability and housing crises in, in Portland in particular. 
The second thing I would say is that I don't think the experience in Oregon should be read as an indictment of decriminalization per se. It's an indictment of our broken uh, behavioral health and social service system. You know, so the law in Oregon was designed if a law enforcement officer came across someone using drugs, they were supposed to provide a citation and a referral to addiction treatment. But we know that Oregon, prior to Measure 110, had the second highest rate of substance use disorder in the nation, but was last for access to substance use treatment. So where, where are you supposed to go with that referral, right? It's just the access, the pathways don't exist. So you know what I would say is that if we're serious about addressing uh, racial disparities in drug-related arrests and racial inequities in overdose rates, uh, like Sheila was highlighting, we, we need to turn to decriminalization. Um, but if we're serious about solving the overdose crisis, we really need a, a whole of society approach, right? And tackle truly our behavioral health systems, our housing crises, especially in these larger urban centers, economic development, you know, so many other things need to be part of the story. Uh, we can't rely on harm reduction alone or any given policy to, to fix many of these chronic systemic problems in American society. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, that, that answer. Um, we'll end now with uh, a few a quick myth debunking uh, mm. a lightning round. Um, and I'd just love each of you, all of our panelists, to share one common myth or misconception about substance use that you'd like to debunk. Um, perhaps I should go first since, I, since I've raised the question. Sure and I think, you know, perhaps um, it might be obvious to those of you on the panel, but I think there is a common misperception, um, you know, in society that drug problems are other people's problems, that mm -hmm. drug problems happen to other folks in other communities. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because it's not my problem, um, w you know, there's no reason for me or my community to invest in um, addressing problems of, of drug use. Um, and, and of course, you know, the opposite is true. Substance use affects all of us. It can affect any family at any level of society, um, any uh, racial or, or ethnic group. Um, and it, it affects, of course, communities across the United States and, and globally. And um, you know, and we, we need to understand it as being, you know, an, an intrinsic uh, public health problem that we all must, you know, invest in and and uh, and work to resolve. Uh, Mavis, why don't you go next? Um, <coughs> just piggybacking on what you said, um, I had um, someone that I was working with, and um, they said to me, you know. I deal with my trauma and my issues and my need to relax or other things chemically. Other people deal with it food. Uh, they may engage in sex. They may engage in other things. And so we all are dealing with um, our traumas, our challenges, our desires in multiple ways. And, you know, people who use drugs are, are just stigmatized in a way where we are still seeing the same deleterious impacts with people who use other means, right, to deal with their traumas. And so, you know, that really was an eye opener for me in terms of stigma. Um, I think maybe another um, myth is that everybody's looking to be saved. Um, that we need to force everyone into formal treatment as the answer. Um, and that's just not the case. We know a number of folks, uh, probably friends and, and confidants, who are recreational users, um, who, if they happen to get stopped by the police, are now sort of on this path. Um, and so I think those are two myths um, that I would, I would elevate. Thanks. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> I would say the same as Mavis, and you were um, saying, um, I don't know, it's just the, the crazy. You can't just say, I'm in it, but you're not. You can't just put one foot in and one out. Either you're in all the way, or you won't be, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, much appreciate it. And thank you. Yeah, I, one of the most harmful myths I see is the idea that uh, people will only be willing to engage in treatment once they hit rock bottom. It's a very pervasive, especially American tr trope, I find. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of things harmful with that. One, especially nowadays with the drug supply, that is a deadly approach. You know, mm -hmm. if we 
uh, let people or allow them to hit rock bottom that can have deadly consequences. Rather, we need to wrap people with love and comp you know, compassion and support like Case is talking about um, and be there for people. And the second thing that's just scientifically wrong with that approach is that the so what we call like the window of willingness to engage in treatment is very unpredictable. So you just need to be there and have systems in place to offer someone the services they need once that window of willingness happens. That's the benefit of overdose prevention centers and other harm reduction programs, right, is that they're there for people. So when that willingness happens, you know, folks like KSF, people on the ground, can make that change and help that person get the care they need when, when they're ready. Wonderful. And Sheila, thank you for joining us online. What myth would you like to debunk? Um, it kind of relates to some of the ones that my uh, esteemed co-panelists have also mentioned. This idea that somehow change happens overnight and that change and success can only look like abstinence if you've been engaging in risky or problematic drug use. Um, and really, I think that when we stop back and look at our own behaviors, those of us who may or may not identify as having an addiction or a substance use problem, think about behaviors that we've tried to change in our lives. How much time did it take for us to think and decide on a pathway? How much time did it take for us to build up the confidence to feel like we were we were like worth making that change for, that we were competent enough to make that change and that we knew how to make that change. And think about all the missteps that we might've made along the way and how um, had many restarts or had to often um, look to others for support uh, as we try to move forward with change. And that oftentimes in the earliest of early days when you're trying to change a habit, you got to celebrate the small wins. And as Dan Big, who many of us think of, may he rest in peace, as um, one of the key pioneers in harm reduction thinking would say, we need to celebrate any positive change. And that when we celebrate any positive change, we are incapable of knowing the possibilities that lie ahead of us and that harm reduction helps to celebrate every positive change along the way and is there for you as you go on this journey and figuring out the strategies that are going to work best for you that are going to be pragmatic and feasible for you and lead to the long-term outcomes that you need and want fantastic that's such a great way to wrap up um, thank you all for being here today and for your thoughtful comments, um, all the uh, panellists. Um, if you missed any part of the discussion, you can watch the recording on, on our YouTube page. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, the substance use and mental health services, Helpline is available 24-7 at 1800 662 HELP. Thanks for joining us and have a great afternoon.